But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. I'm James. We have a completely different episode, really, just in the span of one day than we thought we would have. Yeah, I feel that Final Sunday kind of saved saved the week in Cincinnati. It was looking like everybody was a bit hungover by the Canadian Open. There were a lot of retirements, not as much rain, but I don't know, there, there was like a little bit of energy lacking. I felt mm-hmm. it was a, a crackerjack two days of international sport yesterday yeah. and then today with the women's 100 meter final in Budapest, mm-hmm. where Shakira Richardson won the title. Yeah, her uh, she had never proven herself on the biggest stage, and she did that. It was never any secret that she had tons of talent Mm -hmm. this is not the outcome that we would have liked certainly not but shelly and fraser price's legacy is sealed 15 medals at the world championships well as just reading a tweet and the replies somebody congratulating shakari and talking about how you know this is an amazing result for shelly on one knee at 36 blah 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 and then Betty two six seven four eight two one <laughs> responds and says, "Time to retire?" Question mark. And I wanted to respond and be like, "Time to die?" <laughs> like equally ridiculous question. No. Like, how do you feel about that question, right. Betty? Time to w- w- a bronze medal on an injury? Yes, time to re- sure. Uh, some of the fastest times in history still. Having completed two finals prior to this event, to run. Ten seven seven in that final. Like get get away with all these mm-hmm. derogatory things. <laughs> if you know that reference, that's we're gonna a, send you something. That's a mouth. Jamaican deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it it was rough. You know, we're both Shelly diehards. I've come to a Sharika love, diehard. Love love Sharika so much. Elaine diehard. And well, Elaine is my number three. Sorry. Yes, and it certainly a distant third among the Jamaican women too because. As you observed, Shelly and Sharika were hugging up on Shikari much more than they've ever done on Elaine, their countrywoman. Well, <laughs> there's some there's some coaching drama there. Yes. Where Shelly and Elaine used to train in the same camp and something happened. I don't really know the full hundred of it. But you know, Shelly and Sharika are tight. Yes. People are out here talking about this is the greatest women's 100 meter final ever. And certainly by... The times that these women have run. But Elaine wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And Elaine could have been there. And Elaine should be there next year. So look out in Paris. Yeah, I think, uh, l- let's not forget, like we have in the past 10 years seen races with Shelly, Sharika, Elaine, Carmelita Jetter about, you know, 10-ish years ago. Who Shelly said was one of her greatest rivals. Like we've seen incredible women's 100 meters for the past decade and a half. Like this is not new. I will never talk about Jamaican women sprinting without bigging up the OG, the queen, Merlene Ati. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Merlene Joyce Ati from Hanover. You noted today, you, you pinpointed to me the main difference between the American sprinters and the Jamaican sprinters, which I found very instructive. What? And I tried to make a comparison that a lot of that bravado was displayed by Usain too, to a great degree, certainly by Johan Blake. Okay. But you pointed... To this idea that it's this narrative that these American sprinters must always adhere to. It's like Mm -hmm. throughout time and it's it's almost always been the same. Michael Johnson, I think, was probably the most akin to Usain Bolt in terms of like, I'm just here. I'm just great. I'm going to show up, (laughs) you know, but from Gwen Torrance down the line to what we saw with Noah Lyles. It's this, oh, I have to prove. I have to prove. They said I couldn't do it. They said I couldn't do it. I Like, no, you are great. Be great. And Shikari, this new incarnation of her, you know, it's no secret that we're not huge fans of hers, but she has changed a lot. 
Like, I'm not opposed to becoming right. a fan of Shikari if she continues on this trajectory because right. she has because this person is completely different than who we saw. I don't last want year. to get into that because that becomes a lot of value judgment on okay, okay, what it is to perform like respectability blackness. and whatever perform American blackness mm-hmm. specifically, but her form is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Like she's an incredible sprinter to ro- to watch run. I mean, yes. for me, the greatest to ever do it in terms of beauty when she was on song was Merle Naughty. Like, her form mm. was impeccable. Anyway, that was day two of the great sporting events that happened. Yesterday, we got Coco Goff. Coco Goff. Continuing this great form following her first round loss at Wimbledon, she said a loss to Kennan is something I cannot abide at this <laughs> point in my career. And she has essentially turned her career around in the span of less than three weeks. Well, I mean, she was not on a bad trajectory, but she has come out looking like a different player. That is such hyperbole. No, I don't. Hi- it absolutely. <laughs> is because she's turned her season around for sure. And then now when you yeah. look at her season, she's still just 19. It's a pretty good season. Oh, yeah, like She's she, still only 19. She won a title to start the year. In like, Auckland. But there were plenty of people out there saying, mm, you know, right now I don't really see it for Coco. Sure. And we were putting her in the same camp as Felix, saying as, that she's the, down real bad right, right now. Right. But still, she had, I think, a semi final in the lead up to Wimbledon. It wasn't tragic. No, no. But look what, like, a little confidence can do, a little perspective. I really liked a few of the things that she said in her press conference that I want to read, if you, if you don't mind. This is a nice... If I don't mind, that's that's yeah. a specific question for me, because whenever <laughs> I want to read something that's more than two sentences, it's like, oh my god. Oh yeah, that's not long. Anyway, she was talking about the the paths and the ideas that people have for you as a player, and she said, even the path you want for yourself may not happen. And later she says, I'm going to give it my all at the US Open, and if things go great, that's exciting. And if not... I go back and work hard and get ready for the next one. I just accept the good with the bad. These are common, like, sports psychology tropes, of course. But I just, I like the calm and the perspective because she knows there's going to be now immense expectations put upon her at the U.S. Open. She's a massive draw. She'll be all over the promotional material. But I like this idea even within matches. And I think you can see it. You know, my serve's not working. Or this girl is exploiting my forehand and it's just, it's hitting the bottom of the net. She was able to regroup in a way that I feel is different. And you may say that's exaggeration. She says the path you want for yourself may not happen. I mean, that's an important life lesson. I thought as a child, I'd be a, a vocal superstar. <laughs> I, <laughs> but God said, like, not on my I just watch. have to work on those notes a little bit, you know? And this is why I sing so much on the, sh- on the show, right. despite your discouragement. It's still, still working. <laughs> it's never too late. It's one of the great ironies that you firmly believe that anybody can learn to sing, but you've never encouraged me to. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't mean that anybody can be great. But I do believe that Listen, anyone can learn to match pitches. I know my to... limitations at this point. I'm just saying. <laughs> and of course, this final comes on the back of beating Iga Sviantek in the semifinals. That was the big axis shift for Coco this mm-hmm. season. I'm not going to say her career this season. Because prior to that, she had been, what, 0-7? Lost all 14 sets against Iga. And the only time prior to this match that she'd taken a set past, I think, four games was the very first set they played when she lost a tiebreak. Yeah. And she was also down in that first set against Iga and came back, came back from losing the second set to win the match in the third. Like, this was a huge building block for her. Absolutely. And, uh, of course, it was obvious that Iga was not in top form. She was struggling with the serve. Ground strokes were a little wild at times. But Iga in bad form is still better than almost anybody. (laughs) And she's become a player who can win when she's not playing very well. You could see in the second set that she regrouped. She started just trying to get the ball in, right? Not necessarily pound it, but let's be a little more consistent. Let's move to the net occasionally, which I don't like. 
you know, she she's not comfortable at the net, but she tried it. And she was successful for a set. It's curious to me that Coco was able to do this without fully f- fixing the forehand. Mm-hmm. Or even like having that much more success on the forehand wing, to my mind. I felt like there were a lot of etc. fixes within her psyche and her game that led to this more so than the forehand. Because especially in that second set, there were an alarming number of balls that she hit in the bottom half of the of the net, off the forehand. Right. And if it's one thing a Williams has taught you, is that you never miss in the net. <laughs> and so watching Coco play... Right, because when Iga was missing, she was swinging. Yeah. It was, it was going Missing long. wide, missing long. Yeah. And so if Coco ever f- figures that out properly, or gets to a point where it's not a liability, when she's pressed, watch out, because there are so many other facets of her game that work really well. Mm-hmm. And I mean, look what she's already accomplished, even with that that flaw. But this seems to be part of uh, Brad and Reba's approach at the moment. Reba, who is giving Billy Zane teas. Every time yes. I see him, I see a young Billy Zane. Cal from Titanic, for uh-huh. you youngins. Uh, they both have talked about, well, we're not really trying to rework the stroke at this point. We're in the middle of a season. It's not. It's just not feasible. So Brad's strategy is to avoid it. To avoid harping on it. But they're also working on like footwork approaching the forehand, Mm -hmm. right? So it is still a liability, but it seems like she's grown these mental tools to to get over when it's when it's not working. It's her third title of the season. Did you mention that already? No. Third title of the season. If we were doing the US summer series thing, she would be the one because she also won in DC. She made a quarterfinal last week in Montreal. Where she beat Vondrosheva there as well. Mm -hmm. Lost to Peggy, the eventual champion. 7-5 in the third. There has been no let up from Coco Goff in the last three to four weeks. And so let's see how and if this momentum carries through to New York. Because a a simple thing as where you're placed in the draw can play a huge factor in that. No matter how prepared or ready and willing you are. Right. I mean, you know, there's so many dangerous players in the women's draw. She drew a, a surging Sonia Kennan at Wimbledon. You know, it can happen anywhere. Let's for a second talk about Karolina Mukhova, who made the final here. Top 10. Beat Sabalenka again. Sabalenka, who's within spitting distance of the number one ranking. And so far, at each opportunity, she's had a loss like this. Uh, she lost to Mukhova at the French Open as well. That was 7-5 in the third set. This time it was another three-set match, 6-2. Carolina came into the final not 100%. And she, she played a lot of tennis. Yeah. And she talked about this in her runner-up speech. She wasn't feeling well. The abdominal is a problem. She knew waking up she was not in top form and it was going to be a tough day. But she worked her ass off in that final. She made a straight sets win take two hours, and and it was not easy. And the fruits of her labor is a first-time top 10 birth. Mm -hmm. This is where she belongs. Yes. This is what watching her play tennis has told us about where she belongs from the very start. She's still dealing with injuries, injuries that have delayed her progress over the years, but she's had incredible results this year. And I wish her well. Mm-hmm. And her results this week created this uh, this Czech wall, this phalanx. Is well, that how you say that word? You can't claim Czech wall without, Wait, who said that? without saying that everybody's calling it that. Oh, okay. Well, and I don't know what else to call it. So um, credit to those people who a, coined it. A Czech barricade. <laughs> yes. A Czech fort. From 9 to 12, we've got Vondrosova, Mukhova, Kvitova, and Krečíkova. And, I mean, the bench is just so incredibly deep in Czech tennis. The idea for this episode was, I guess, typically we would have tacked this Cincinnati wrap onto a U.S. Open preview. But we will want to have a shorter recording process when we get to New York for that episode. Yeah. And also, we took a two-week break. Uh, Has it been July. that long? No, I mean, we recorded last week, but we don't want August to to just... Gl- pass by and only have like three episodes right we are beholden to our stats now to a certain degree because july was our, was our biggest month yeah. 
ever. I mean, we're re- we're really just trying to compete with ourselves. And that there's a direct correlation to that with the number of episodes we release. So if we do two, then it's just going to be... That, that's just not on. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be a flat month. And we, we are not about the flat month at this point. Right. So we'll talk a lot more about what uh, this U.S. Open series, so to speak, means for the U.S. Open. But I am I just want to say, like, I'm so excited to see Coco so fired up, like so excited on court because she had like she had a tough few months. You know, it, you could tell that she was feeling down on herself. And to see her like electrified and dancing and stuff like that. Twirling? Right? It's just like it is it is really good for the sport. Add another wrinkle to the top of women's tennis as to who to watch to win any given week. Mm-hmm. Coco Goff is now a credible, viable candidate every single week. Yep. It was also a fantastic week. Coco's win capped a, a fantastic week for Black American tennis players. Yes. Taylor Townsend and Alicia Parks teamed up in women's doubles. They beat seeds two, three, four, and five to win both of their first 1,000 level title. The celebration from those two after they won. Love it. (laughs) Taylor, remember, Taylor has been the runner-up in two of the past four slam finals. This is her third doubles title this year. She's moving up to number five in the doubles rankings, which is her career high. And I think she's proven over the past year or so that she can pick a partner who's really good on the baseline and they can create magic together. Or she can just pick a partner, period. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And make it work. Yeah. And now it seems she has the influence to just call upon someone and they'll say yes. Alicia said, Taylor texted me and I was like, I'll dump whoever I'm with. I'm like, damn, <laughs> damn, girl. <laughs> this reminded me of Coco's main partner is Peggy, right? Jessica mm-hmm. Pagula. Mm-hmm. And Pagula was asked in press somewhere, it may have been Montreal about, or DC, did she even play it? Sometime this summer, she was mm-hmm. asked, uh, so is it true that you guys are done? You're not playing together anymore? And she's like, what? <laughs> like, we take one week off right. and this is a story that's, you know, <laughs> we're just not playing this week. That's it. Yeah. And truly, is there any singles player that plays more doubles than Pagula and Goff together? Right. Give them a break. Oh, and Taylor Townsend just got into the main draw of the U.S. Open, by the way, because Simona Halep was withdrawn. Uh, you know, let's let's just be really real for a second. She was never in. Was that necessary, though? Uh, I mean, no, no, it is. Because I was very annoyed that all of these, like, scammy tennis news sites, you know the ones, were reporting, Simona Halep is on the entry list for the U.S. Open. That means there's been a verdict and she's been cleared in her... Guys, where, like, where did you get this? Diana Estremska literally flew to Australia while on a doping suspension, <laughs> just in case she could play. Did that mean mm. that she had been exonerated? History will tell us no. She did not play that. I mean, maybe she had a good time in Australia in quarantine because that was also during. I'm I'm getting off the point, but that really was a wild decision. <laughs> a lot of self belief, kind, kind of iconic, to be honest. Yeah, she's had many moments over the years. <laughs> yes. All right. Do you remember the... when she tried to fix racism with the black Please. and white for the half can... half black and what? Can we not okay. the half moon cookie? Yeah, that mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. On the men's side. Well, you all know what happened. Don't call it a rivalry. It's been only four <laughs> matches. Like, this is... Well, this is, is wild. It is me. a rivalry. These are the best two players. It's, it's, it's a May-December thing. It, it promises to be a rivalry. Mm, it's becoming a rivalry. That's what promising promises okay. means. Sure. Yes. Currently, I don't think you can call something a rivalry after four matches. Oh. Okay. Especially when only two of them have been good. There's a lot of... One was the cramping situation. There's a lot of fervor about this. Number one, number two, we haven't always got that in the top top of men's tennis in recent years. Like you said, there is the new gen, old gen, Mm -hmm. big three, next whatever component to it that has a lot of men frothing. Oh, yes. About this 
you know. <laughs> like, you said men. Yeah. It is men because we know everybody out here watching tennis can see that men's tennis has sucked for the last extended extended well, yeah. stretch. Like it's been a terrible product. And so <laughs> to have this gifted to you now it's amazing well, you, for these dude they bros. Need they need it. The ATP needs this to be a rivalry. Otherwise, yeah. what are we doing? I mean, Djokovic is so great, yes. But he's going to be 37 and still wiping the floor with pretty much everybody. Alcaraz like, is the only one who can do this. The only one on men's tennis yeah. actively. We don't know what Rafa will look like when, he, when and if he comes back. Prior to Carlos, Rafa was the only other one. Mm. Such is the greatness of Djokovic. On a tennis court. Right, right. And only. Um, <laughs> and so, fine. This could be a rivalry. They delivered again. Yesterday. Didn't look like it they did. for the it first was, set and a half. Well, like many Djokovic matches, it was a weird one. This will will be called and has already been called the greatest Masters final in history. The Maybe the greatest set and a half in exactly. Masters... Yeah. history but you know this is how it goes uh it was almost four hours novak saved a match point in the second set alcaraz saved four match points in the third set before One getting to a tiebreaker was ridiculous just very audacious the way that he plays right well this is the thing about carlos that sets him apart from all the other pretenders he has the audacity, which is why we named that Wimbledon yeah. recap episode, the audacity of it all. He has the audacity to try certain things and the skill to pull them off. Absurd. Because he comes to the court thinking, I'm going I'm to win this. I can be Djokovic and I'll show you how. And I'm going to have fun doing it. Well, I mean, I don't even know if it's all that. It's just that he is good enough and comfortable enough to hang Right. That that's that's a base level that most of these men cannot get to. They can hang for maybe two, three games, maybe a set, and then when Djokovic goes into lockdown mode, it's curtains. Yeah. Djokovic's lockdown mode does not affect Carlos Alcaraz. No. Because generally you're not going to blast him off the court. And for some of these guys, these would be rivals, that's what they have. That's all they have. Alcaraz can rally with him and just stick around and then try the most ridiculous shots and make them happen. Now, why I said this match is weird is because we saw Djokovic in purportedly horrendous physical condition in the first two sets, suffering in the heat. He just looked down and out. He He did. looked. But... I know what you're saying. I know what you're going to say. What I'm going to say is that... that We've been here before. We've been here before. Uh, Commentators... Always fall for it. (laughs) I'm sure sometimes it's real. Some of it's real. Some of it's exaggerated. Djokovic is an extremely theatrical player. I don't know why that's controversial. Mm -hmm. He's, I mean, there have been much worse examples of this. This rope-a-dope trickery that he did with Andy Murray and the final of the Australian Open. He's a stunt queen. Those were stunts. That, That was gamesmanship, what he did then. This was just like, are you for real? Again, the the I second saw, bathroom break. I saw somebody the, tweet. I think it was Candy tweeted that in response to somebody saying that the conditions were way too harsh, too hot, too humid to function, and she was like, "Well, maybe if you had come to the U.S. and practiced in the U.S. in these conditions for the last however many weeks, you'd have been more prepared to deal with these situations." I don't know. I, yeah, they're hard for us, but these guys, don't they train for this? They train in Dubai, they train the, in Florida, they do, you know, like, eh. The heat rule is in effect. Perhaps it was just not having played much since Wimbledon. Mm-hmm. And that's a choice. Regardless, all this is happening. He's being bathed in ice towels. Carlos is up a set and a break and plays a turd of a game. <laughs> Just an absolute stinker. And here we go. Game on. Yeah. And at some point in that second set, we get what we know was coming. What we've seen so many times. Give me the juice. I want the juice. Cretina! (laughs) 
this incredulous Djokovic barking at his box to give him his magic juice. And after having seen this time upon time upon time upon time upon time, why is the box uncertain about what <laughs> Novak like, is calling what, for? What do you need, honey? Can it's, you can you scream louder? The juice. And in that regard, <laughs> I am on Djokovic's side. No. How many fucking times do I have to scream the juice no. for you to give me the juice? I'm not. In that situation, mm-hmm. I'm just saying, in that regard, the box is crazy for not knowing it's a juice. But also, why isn't Novak bringing the magic juice onto the court? Does it have... Oh, they say it has to be freshly mixed. Can it not stay on the cord? No, it, need it a, has oh, to be freshly mixed and cold. Does it need a cryogenic cooler? Like, and they don't want anyone to see what's in it. I'm not implying anything. They just... Mm. Whatever mix he's taking, they don't want other players to see. Mm. But this ties into the spectacle It is no, of what you're talking what about. What I, I genuinely believe is that this is pure spectacle. The screaming at the box... The box pretending like they can't hear him. I mean, how many times have we been through this? Bring the stuff on court. So he said creatina. Creatine. I didn't, I actually didn't know that creatine was legal. Apparently it's legal in almost every sport. Mm. The, because obviously during the uh, the Maguire and Souza days, Mark Maguire was taking creatine and people were like, oh, this is controversial, whatever. Right, but Little did it... we know that everybody was doping hardcore. Right, but <laughs> is it in the same form, in the same dosage? Like, I don't know. I I have, I have not gone into that to be able to say that it's blanketly the same thing. Oh, okay. Right, right. But so creatine is an amino acid. It's found in our bodies naturally. We can also get it from food, like from seafood and meat. And athletes take it because it can may improve that kind of uh, quick burst energy. It can bring hydration to the muscles, promote muscle recovery, and may also increase our own production of anabolic hormones like HGH, testosterone, insulin, etc. Mm. Does Is it something that works immediately? No idea. But as we know, athletes are superstitious. They depend on these things. The placebo effect is incredibly effective for athletes. It's something I mean, we he needs know, right now. We know that nobody can pray on water and turn it into wine. Right. So whatever he puts his mind to, he can make happen. Just, I reject the spectacle of screaming for the creatine or whatever secret mixture he's got because it is just a show. It's obscene. <laughs> yes. Can you imagine like screaming at your partner like that? At you? Uh, yeah. Screaming at your wife? No. No, I would not continue no. to be in the box after that. No. Anyway. Mm. Yeah, so that happened, and then the match got good. Right, right, it did. It went on forever. As I said, Carlos saved four match points as the third set went on. And it gets to a tiebreak, and, I mean, nobody is better at tiebreaks. This was a... It, that was worst-case scenario for Carlos. You know, it would well, have been better, easier to break before. He was done match points serving at 3-5 in the third set. It was better <laughs> than that. Well, yeah. You have here noted that this quote-unquote rivalry, or matchup, as I would say, is giving shades of the Steffi Martina rivalry. No, I'm asking, is it? Is it? Uh, what? And okay. uh, am I crazy? So the Steffi Martina rivalry, they met 18 times. They split their matches 9-9. Nine and nine. And it's similar in that Martina was just exiting one of the greatest imperial periods in tennis history in 85-ish, 84, 85. Steffi's coming up as a kid. The way their rivalry worked is that Martina won the first few times, but Steffi became good really, really fast, right? Steffi grabbed the reins of the WTA from straight from Martina and Chrissy, wins a Golden Slam, but Martina remained a formidable rival to Steffi, even as she was well into her 30s. They met six times in slam finals. And so I'm not saying that this Djokovic-Alcaraz rivalry is going to be that, because that's, I mean, that's kind of unlikely. But you're meeting an aging goat who is still better than everybody. Right. It's giving Agassi playing against Federer, Agassi playing against Nadal, but we didn't get that many matchups. And also, Agassi couldn't do 
what Novak is doing now. And also Agassi wasn't at the top of the game right. when that was happening. And simply physically, he couldn't yeah. do it. Uh, so I'm just, you know, not to say that it will become as great or as storied, but Steffi Martina is is a rivalry I think that a lot of people forget because it wasn't the main rivalry of each of their respective eras. But they met more times than Steffi and uh, Monica did. Hmm. So look out for this. Number one versus number two at the U.S. Open. <laughs> yeah. Could happen. Novak has not won the U.S. Open in a, quite a while. I do wonder if this match will have any lingering effects for either player. I hope not. But it's not the ideal final that you want to play when you're leading into the U.S. Open. The more I watch Carlos play, the more I appreciate him. I know I haven't always been the biggest supporter on this podcast, but we got this tender moment with him speaking to his brother in the stands after this match. That was very sweet. Hmm. Oh, I didn't see it. Well, <laughs> I guess you'll just have to take my word for it. I wonder if he called his friend Alex Verov and scheduled another golf date for the U.S. Ooh. Open. Let me ask Let me ask tennis.com. I'm talking to you, Sinclair, right now. Why are you writing these puff pieces about Alexander Zverev? Who is directing who is, the editorial? No, who is influencing this? Who is yeah. editorially in charge there? Because, like, this is an easy thing to avoid at this well, point. Well, I think at this point it's uh, purposeful. Mm. But to your point, there are very few, if any, ATP players who aren't chummy with that guy. Yeah, yeah. And one of them is Medvedev, and the reasons for that may not be the reasons why you would hope it to be. It may not, but it's it the just best might just be got. like stand by your woman, it's... and that's it, which is not something everybody has these days. No, <laughs> no. So we'll take it. Alcaraz maintains. What do you think the the point lead is over Djokovic for number one? Oh, I have no idea. I haven't looked in a while. That's like, what I guess. Uh, 600 points? 20 points. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 9815 to 9795. So, that is something also on offer yeah. at the US Open. And let's be real. Carlos is behind the eight ball. I mean, it's practically impossible for him to keep it, right? Because well, he has to Djokovic defend. didn't yeah. play and he has to defend. So, oh. on the women's side, the number one ranking is up for grabs again. Iga does have to progress one round further than Arena Sabalenka, as far as I understand. The other facet of this tournament is that we saw a whole bunch of retirements. It turns out that playing back to back Masters 1000s in scorching heat on hard courts is not that great for the body. Yeah, plus Canada was interrupted by rain a lot, players were playing on weird schedules. We saw retirements from Rabakina, Runa, McDonald, Lajevic, Davidovic, Boskova, Vekic. And aside from the retirements, there were just some disappointing losses. Both defending champions lost in the round of 32. That was Chorich and Garcia. That could just be them well, being Chorich and Garcia. It could be. But also we saw uh, the Toronto champion Yannick Sinner lose to Lajovic. Montreal champ Pagula lost to Trevisan. This is all in the round of 32. We also saw a couple of ATP veterans continue to have good results. Mm-hmm. Gal Mofis is just beating top 10 players again. <laughs> Where is this coming from? He's come back from ugh, many, many months being injured, and he's playing well again. Mm-hmm. He beat Nori and Demon Hour here. Another one. Runner up in Toronto, losing to Mofis, and Stan Wawrinka. Who beat Nakashima, beat Francis Tiafo, now undefeated still against Tiafo. Yeah. Uh, that match weird. against Francis, rifling backhands all over the court. Mm. Not ideal uh, preparation for Francis, who is defending a semifinal of this U.S. Open. Has not had a good summer. No. We also had Sitsipas against the Bee Lady. <laughs> this. Okay, um... This woman, in her little sundress and visor, made herself famous. She impersonated a bee. Bzz, bzz. Right as Tsitsipas was serving. Repeatedly. So much so that Stefanos phantom swatted the, a bee. I mean, this is too good. This <laughs> is incredible. Simply <laughs> incredible theater to watch. 
So he goes up to the umpire, Nacho Forcadell, and he says, there's a person imitating a bee behind me. And Nacho says, oh yeah? I'll take care of it. And Tsitsipas says, okay, it's a buzz right before I serve. And he waits about two seconds and says, do you think it's okay? And Nacho's like, no, I, no, I said I would take care of it. Dude, calm and down. so Tsitsipas goes to the back of the court and starts investigating. He asks, who did it? Who did it? Who is the bee lady? And with the swiftness, the snitches snitched. Pointing at this oh, woman. I, I would have been the snitch as well. I would have, <laughs> honestly. And so Stephanos is like, All right, so I, I, I need her gone. I, she needs to go. And She's the like, lady she, ap- she starts apologizing. She's so sorry. At that point, like, own it. You know, like, I yeah, didn't... I am I am that bad bitch that was a bee. Yeah. And what I you... got into Stephanos' head. What are you going to do about it? And so what? I got kicked out. And what of it? I just, how do you apologize for that? Like, you did something purposefully to disrupt a player. And then you're like, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. It's not like you tripped and spilled a milkshake. Mm. Right? Like, this is something you did on purpose because you were trying to be rude. This, what, what does the apology sound like? This brings me to story time because I have a bee story from when I was of in high school. Of course you do. Not I a do. spelling bee, but a bee bee. I have one of those two, but not yeah. for this instance. In maybe grade three, we had art class. And to go to art class, it was held in the art building. Ooh. Which is a separate structure. Bougie. And you had to line up along these ascending stairs before you were let into the classroom. And while we were waiting on those stairs, her name was Carice. She hatched a plan. Carice and Gregory, the two of them. I I won't share their last names. Exposing these kids. How many years later? (laughs) And our teacher, we had a substitute teacher at that time. Her name was Miss Beswick. And she was filling in And she was filling in for Mrs. Bowen Lawson. Okay. And nobody really liked Beswick. She was kind of annoying. Her name was Miss Beswick. Mm -hmm. And given that we were 12, 13, we thought it was hilarious, directed by Carissa and Gregory, that upon entry to the classroom, where we all have to stand at attention, waiting to be addressed, (laughs) good morning, three, five. And then you say, good morning, Mrs. Beswick or Miss Beswick. As soon as we're greeted, we in unison should start doing what the bee lady did. Mm -hmm. Because Beswick, Beeswick, you know. Very clever. So Miss Beswick stood there aghast when this happened. (laughs) She did the best she could to process it before coming back with, I am not a bees. (laughs) Which made such an impression that you remember it to this day. Oh, yes. And it's become the title of this episode. Well, we'll see. Maybe oh, something else okay. will will inspire us. How about B for real? Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ms. Beswick. You badass kids. Kids? And I thought, like, Jamaican kids were scared of their teachers. Well, she was just a substitute teacher. Oh, I see. So I feel like this is universal. Right, like, right. You oh, kids you are mean. Disrespect kids subs. are yeah. mean. They're awful. And at that age, to each other, to teacher, to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, Dominic Team. Has he seen the light? <laughs> this is so good. No, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> he was he was promoting this thing on his socials. Uh, he's partnering with this. I guess it's like an app, like a startup called Fantium, to help finance up and coming young players. And it, so it gives a platform for fans, for regular people, to invest. In the careers of young players. Because tennis is so expensive. Yeah. So we could give $1,000 and say, mm. hey, we got to play a part in the world number 1,000, crack the top 100. Right. Which, on its face, is great. But the irony just smacked me in the face. And I laughed and laughed because Dominic was the one who, during the first lockdown, the players, the top 10 players especially, I think, were asked to give some money. To start a fund to help mm-hmm. support the lower rank yeah. players. And Dominic, not only did he say, I don't want to do that. He said, he went on the... to say, no, a lot of them are lazy and that's why they're uh-huh. ranked low. And he said, the only handout I give is to my brother. That's <laughs> oh, it. Right. 
Oh my god. And we, I mean, we dragged him pretty hard back then in 2020 because we didn't have anything else to do. But I guess now that he's been through some struggle, he's seen how hard it is on the Challenger circuit. Maybe that's it. No, I don't think it's a real change because it's very telling. Like, it's very capitalistic to say... No, first of all, I would never give my money to low ranked players. <laughs> but, but you can I, but give your money. Somebody created a startup company where you can invest your money on some freaking app because this is innovative, right? Giving your money isn't innovative, but asking people to give their money in this specific way. Now that's free thinking. What a king. Was that too hard? No, was it, it was harsh? absolutely harsh enough. Because philosophically, yeah, that's great. You know, if it gives more opportunities to, to people who are not rich, who were not born rich, to play tennis, that's great. Look, have him keep trying to make amends. Keep coming. <laughs> you know, maybe we'll we'll give it up, give up the ghost <laughs> of COVID Dominic. Right. Um, Amanda Anisimova, she announced earlier this year that she was taking sort of a sabbatical from tennis. And she indicated that she might be going to Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She posted on Instagram uh, this photo of herself, one where she was wearing a a backpack with the university, one where she had a name tag on that said Group 10. Some intrepid reporters at Tennis.com said uh, Nova's orientation is going on this week. So it was probably her orientation group. You are an orientation leader. Yes, Can you imagine having Amanda in your group? They probably, they don't know who she is, but uh, she's also been painting and selling her paintings to benefit a few charities she's chosen. So she has been busy during the sabbatical. Mm -hmm. It's, this is so, I'm just so happy for her. Like she's chosen this and young athletes very often don't get to choose things in their careers. She's got time. She's got time. Exactly. To have many different lives and still come Mm -hmm. back to tennis. If she so chooses. We got word that the doubles pairing of Kapal and Robert Farah will be retiring after the U.S. Open. Yeah. A lot of folks noted that this is one of the few teams that has played almost exclusively together for really the better part of a decade. There hasn't really been much partner switching. They have 19 titles together. And uh, only one of them, Juan Sebastian Cabal, has won a title with someone else. Uh, that was with uh, Treat Hue at Las Cab- Los Cabos. They are the Wimbledon and U.S. Open champions of 2019. They spent 29 weeks together at number one and far an additional 39 weeks on his own. And yeah, he was kind of the Ash Barty of COVID in men's doubles. Well... Far is also known for two other things. Contaminated meat <laughs> and for displaying meat and, on Instagram. Wow. Uh, endless thirst trapping <laughs> on Instagram. He knows. You know, if like... These people are not oblivious to right. what they're doing. Exactly. Marcos Giron out here bouncing setting from up, the baseline. Setting up a camera behind him. Like, he knows what he's doing. Borna Toric knows what he's doing. Denis Shapovalov out of the U.S. Open, unfortunately, with a knee injury that kept him out of the entire summer swing. Couldn't play in Canada. Another person who will not be playing the U.S. Open, Juan Martín Del Potro. Early in the year, we saw Juan Martín say, you know, I would love to play the U.S. Open one last time. This after he'd already retired. The U.S. Open being the site of his lone slam title, Mm. the 09 U.S. Open. And so he said he was going to do everything in his power to make this happen, presumably with the aid of a wild card. And we now know that that will not happen. He says, quote, as you know, my desire to return to such a special court like the one at the U.S. Open had me very excited. I pursued every possible means in order to get there, but my body is not 100% with me to let me feel comfortable and content to share in such a unique moment one more time with you all. So I don't know if this is it for good or maybe he'll try again next year i don't think he's too old to give it a go again next year i i don't know just that these plans have been thwarted in the past we've done a section called the rant which we blatantly stole from the read and now it seems like 
almost every podcast has a rant section. That whole podcast where those two oh two I've white ladies or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything is I've had it I've had it I've had it with so and so they I mean their TikTok game is undefeated like it well they have a, they a have profile. a team of producers sure. who are they I don't know who they are I'm just keeping them at a safe distance laughing at the funny bits and knowing oh, just in case. that some cancellation is probably coming. <laughs> no. It is what should be expected. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're trying very hard to be progressive. And I I mean, this, I think, is who they are. And they've even said, like, as white ladies from the South, you'd expect us to be one way. Um, I don't know. I don't really know who they are. Yeah, I mean, I've seen videos where they've read listener or reader responses to the effect of, you know, I used to watch your videos and kiki and kaka but you've gone too far with this trans stuff you've gone too far with this and they're like well you know well fuck right off i don't want you listening go to hell (laughs) and in a world of martina naratilovas that's a welcome presence Uh, for now uh, yeah for now yeah do you want to start do you want me to start i'll start okay if you are a listener of this podcast you've heard me rant about this thing so many times Mm -hmm. so so many times and you can probably pause the episode now think about it and in five seconds know that i'm going to be ranting about people telling people to retire so an offshoot of that now is venus williams again venus is 43 years old she has played more than she has in the last few months but with the benefit of wild cards And so the argument from these people is that she's undeserving of wild cards at this point. How long will this charade go on for? How, just how many wild cards should Venus Williams be given before she can just go away and retire? Mind you, this is after she beat the number 16 seed in Cincinnati showed up and beat Veronica Kudermatova in straight sets, coming back from double break deficits in both sets to win. She even won the last six games of that second set, beating her 6-4-7-5. She was up 6-1-2 love on Zhang Qingwen in, this, in her next match before what looked to me like injury limited her movement. Mm-hmm. And we now find out that she pulled out of tennis in the land, the Cleveland mm-hmm. tournament, because of a recurring knee injury. And it's kind of unclear if she's going to be able to make good on that wild card for the U.S. Open at this point. But what we've seen from Venus in 2023, all of 2023, is that when she's on court and she's healthy, she can beat almost anybody still at 43 years old. And so the takeaway for me is not should Venus Williams still get wild cards? It's should these 20-year-olds be embarrassed? That's a more valid question. To oh, that a 43 year And I don't think... Them? That that's a charitable question to ask, but it's a more valid question to ask than should Venus Williams, the active leader in slam titles, who is still playing tennis at a high level, whether or not she should retire. Ahead of Wimbledon, she beat Camilla Georgi in three sets, an epic match, before taking Yelena Ostapenko to three sets in the round of 16. What I'm also seeing is that a lot of this talk is coming from Dude bros. I saw a couple of accounts. One of them claims that he works for ESPN. Really? And his entire WTA commentary is waiting for Venus Williams to retire because this is ridiculous. And what that struck in me, it really struck a chord because I started in college as a journalism major. And then I was like, oh, there's something called sport management. I'll do that. And then I was like, eh, ick, the people that I have to be in class with. <laughs> And so I ended up with sports sociology. It was called sports studies, right? Mm -hmm. And so what this is giving to me is that these are all clowns, these dude bros who saw sport management as a major in college and went on to terrorize their professors. I was in those classes. They show up after having had 10 boiled eggs for breakfast (laughs) in their Division (laughs) Three football uniform terrorizing the professors the three women who would be in those classes i hope that there are more now but that was the experience for me and now they've gone on to terrorize the women in their professions because you know that that's what's going on 
what do you think that work environment is at ESPN? What it's like there? Mm-hmm. With their middling professional lives. And now they're out here terrorizing me on social media and Venus Williams. And so what I would like to say to them and Betty 2346579 is, should Venus Williams retire? Should she not get any more wild cards? Or should you just shut the fuck up? I've had it. To borrow from those two white ladies, I've had it with it. The disrespect on Venus Williams' name. Like, do you not know who she is? Clearly not. Do you not know who you're dealing with here? Do you remember how she advocated for equal prize money at Wimbledon, got it, and then won the title in the first year it was equalized? You remember that? If she's out here losing six love, six love, I can stomach that argument more. Far be it from me to make it. I wouldn't dare. No, no. But this is not what that is. We are not there. And it's telling to me that this is your, this is you being a dog with this particular bone when John Isner is out here getting wild cards to the US Open, when Steve Johnson is still getting wild cards to the US Open. His lone achievement in his life is a bronze medal at some Olympics. Well, to be fair, he did earn the wild card playoff this year. Okay, but I, but also wild cards are inequitable by definition. Precisely. Right? Uh, what about Ryan Harris's seventy something wild cards? Jack Sox high sixties wild Harrison. cards. I think he said Harris. Harrison. Harrison. Har- that guy. <laughs> that other guy. Right. Why? Why are these not the targets? No, but those are not the names in your mouth. And so what you're giving me is you feel if you you feel you now have an irrefutable target to place on Venus Williams's back. That you, you really couldn't when you really wanted to all those years ago, you know? But no, you, you, f- you feel that you can take her out of this sport. It's giving racist to me. It's giving racista. <laughs> That's what it's giving to me. And guess what? People are watching her matches. They're right. saying her name. She is a draw. How many draws do the men have in tennis? This is the big, this is the big myth with men's tennis, right? That they're such a bigger draw than the woman. Mm. Nobody is coming to tennis to watch Max Purcell, to watch Lloyd Harris. Damn. To watch... Double homicide. Alexis Gunnar... Alexis Gallar, no. Sorry, he just caught a stray bullet. But, like, a lot of these people are perfectly good tennis players. Very good tennis players. But you hang your hat on them still being able to beat the number one player in the WTA Tour, but yet nobody's watching them play tennis. Nobody gives a fuck. People care about Venus Williams. So the fact that she may not be out here winning titles, winning slams, making second weeks is irrelevant. She's still competitive. She is still the fucking Venus Williams. Period. And that's my rant. All right. So I actually have two. One uh, was birthed last night. (laughs) I don't know if you, if anyone saw this tweet from the commentator Robbie Koenig. He tweeted last night, how does Carlos Alcaraz sit down with balls that big? Does he have elephantitis of the balls? I I feel like last night I knew where to start with this. Now I don't. This is so stupid. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I know like any, any criticism of this kind of language will be met with like, you are so soft. You're such soft. a pussy. But let's like, we, the, we can't really interrogate what soft really no, means no, because no. that's not how I intended it. Exactly. Mm-mm. Not allowed to talk about soft anymore. That was very controversial. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you if you pick at this, you're a snowflake. You're a baby. Whatever. I hate this shit. I hate it. The idea that testicles are this symbolic seat of power that if somebody has balls, it means they're audacious, they're gutsy. It's First of all, it's crass, but it's gross. And I want you to think about if women went around saying, "My, I have a huge vagina. My labia is so powerful. Can you imagine a female athlete saying, or, or a commentator saying, that woman has such impressive private parts and using that as a metaphor? The thing is, no, you cannot. You cannot imagine that because, first of all, female organs are not seen as powerful. They're seen as a site of pain and suffering, embarrassment, queasiness. Men are afraid of the female body. So we would never imbue it with power, 
right? We would imbue it with, oh, it would, it would be incredibly crass in our culture to talk about the female body in the way that we talk about the male body, because... which is, which is the, the source of all power, bravery, courage, and excellence that an athlete can have. It's all associated with the male body. So yeah, like maybe I'm getting a little grandiose here, but it's so offensive and gross. What what would compel you to tweet that? I said on the last episode that I hate sports. I hate sports. I hate the culture that surrounds it. I barely even like tennis. And this is also what I meant when I said I hate talking to men about sport. Mm -hmm. Because what the fuck do you mean? It's just meant... And they'll claim it's unintentional. And it's likely so. But this is how people are socialized to talk about right. and think about sport. It may be because unconscious, but this by is design, learned. it is to gatekeep who has the power, who holds the power in tennis. Only the guy who has the massive balls, the massive cojones. And Carlos contributes to this all yes, the time, he does. talking about his cojones and everything, which I also find crass and I hate it. Only those people can be all powerful, who can sit on the throne who can command the rightful attention the worthy attention of sport viewers and the reason that you're powerful is because you are male because not because you you've done anything that are associated you haven't with, done anything to own it with maleness right but by default you are given this position mm -hmm. and that's what the patriarchy is <laughs> <laughs> and some occasionally you'll hear Somebody say, oh, that woman has balls. And it's a way to say she is powerful because she can emulate a man, mm -hmm. right? Like she can succeed in a man's world playing a man's game. That's not equity. And she can all. do things that reminds me of what a man can do. Right. That's right. not of merit in its own right, in her own right. Um, my other rant, God, it feels very anticlimactic at this point. My other rant was just a rant to you privately that I'm so tired of hearing about Taylor Swift's tour. <laughs> I'm on TikTok a lot, right? I have this terrible routine before bed, just like going through TikTok and stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I wake up, actually. And when you're and taking a break from work, when you're eating lunch. <laughs> I want to know. That my algorithm is usually so attuned to what I want to see. Why am I getting nonstop Taylor Swift tour videos? Like, I don't care. I don't like... Taylor Swift. I don't want to hear anything about her. I wish her the very best. I know, you know, her fans really care about numbers. So I'm so glad that her numbers are bigger than everybody else's because that's all that matters. Not the quality of the music. Um, <laughs> clearly. Uh, I just, I, I beg, I beg. You're whining to, like a sexy baby right to now. To stop. <laughs> I beg to stop hearing about Taylor. My algorithm... I mean, she's released, what, 25 albums in the past three years but since there's, COVID? There's a girl boss reason for that. There's a few... No, there's a few new ones. And then there's a thousand re-recordings because she doesn't have control of her masters. Mm -hmm. And now she does. I, I just, gather that she's handing out tons of money to people who work on the tour. Okay. Truck drivers, whatever, doing a lot of good, making donations in cities that she's in. Okay, that's great. It's just that's amazing. That I just don't want to hear about. If it. I may chime in as well. Well, it is my rant. It is your rant. Mm. The mm. <laughs> what the, is this? <laughs> mm. The talent level has just never quite risen to the hype for me, and <laughs> well, maybe now, it's one of the clearest indicators of me being a dinosaur. I did just celebrate a birthday. I'm more mm. aged than I was the last time more aged. I recorded. Yeah, it's just not for me. Well, you know, if you don't like Taylor Swift, you obviously hate women. Um, Clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just her music is not my cup of tea. I don't think she's bad. I just, I, I don't like it. I just think she's not a very good songwriter. Oh, Personally, yeah. I think there are quite a few songs where I like certain bits of it. And then the lyrics just derail. Mm -hmm. They just fly right off the handle. Like when she says, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. You could go anywhere with that. <laughs> it's many and you, open and roads you went to sexy baby. and then you went to sexy baby like i don't understand it makes no sense to me <laughs> and for for the women that she speaks to and speaks for that's great for you please leave me leave me alone 
My TikTok algorithm has been winning lately. It Mine took has me been down a whole hyenas. A, a days long rabbit hole of Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks. Mm-hmm. It, Which you know is very much my vibe. Last night it took me down a Fantasia Barino rabbit hole. Mm. That was great. Reliving her summertime performance on American Idol. Incredible. I've been getting every single video from Kelly Clarkson's residency in Vegas. Very into mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sorry for you that this has yeah, been your experience. Because that would be a nightmare for me. I was like, have I landed on straight TikTok or something? <laughs> uh, okay, end of the rant. Yeah. While we were recording, we got some clarification on one of the videos that we saw. <laughs> stemming oh. from the women's 100 meter final. Because you alluded to... Sharika and Shelly giving um, Shikari more love than they ever did to Elaine in situations like these, right? (laughs) And so I saw this live where Shelly was saying something. The three of them are together afterward. They have their fake medals on with their flags. And she's saying something to Shikari. fake medals? Yes, not the real one. They get that the day after or later on in the day. Oh, okay. And Shelly covers her mouth. And she says something to Shikari, and Shikari thinks for a second and then comes back and then they all just start <laughs> cackling. And so we find out just now what it is that was said. Shelly, with her bad self, she's so mischievous. <laughs> <laughs> she says to Shikari, you know how long you are saying I get a gold medal? Which, on the face of it, is so rude. (laughs) Like, this woman has just created a historic moment for herself and her country and in the sport itself, right? And Shelly brings the levity. And Shikari, not not skipping a beat, says to her, Akaza, you! (laughs) Are your fault! (laughs) Which is the truth. It is the truth. (laughs) It was really cute. Shelly is so funny. And you know, like she's Shelley, a troublemaker. Yes, but she has like such a just a sweet demeanor about her because she went over to Shikari right away. Like there, it's just Shelly is the goat of her sport. She has how many gold medals in the one hundred meter? She's so gracious and she's just like a cool girl, right? Right. But that was an incredible moment. Yes, I, I loved mm-hmm. every minute of it because it's telling to that Shikari received it that way too yes you know because a a lesser person would have been could have been offended by that Mm. anyway that's the end of tbs 312 we're going to come to you later in the week with our u.s open preview it will it will be mostly draw driven yeah yeah and hopefully not too long i can't be spending that much time in a hotel room recording while i'm in new york city i just (laughs) i just can't there's too much to see too many people to see my name is jonathan you can find me on twitter at at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. You can find everything body serve related at linktree.com slash the body serve. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.